And I'm hoping this was working. It looks like the microphone is working. Yes. <laughs> and oh, I've got a really bright light right behind me. That's not a brilliant design, is it? Um, I might see if I can just go and fix that. Um, I didn't look at the camera before I started off. It looks like I'm kind of bathed in this holy glow. <laughs> so that's, um, that's a bit weird. Um, right, let me go and sort that light out first. I'll be back in just a moment. There we go. There we go. Hopefully you can still hear me. So, um, right. So who have we got online? Alpha Epic 11 and Steve Shaw. Good evening to you both. Good to see you. Thank you very much for popping along. I'm always amazed by how quickly after the summer the nights start drawing in. Um, when I started these streams, it was only a couple of a couple of months ago. How long have I been doing this? Not very long. Um, and it was like light when I started and it was light when I finished. And now it's, um, I don't know if I can pick my laptop up. Look at that. It's just, it's just it's dark. What's going on? Time moves too fast. Um, a, a horrible march of time, but there we go. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Ah, dear. Dear. Anyway, so, um, oh, uh, thanks for the comment there, Steve. Six month unemployed, being going mad. Yes, being going mad. <laughs> or trying to get better. Writing off and on due to mood, so I'm looking forward to that. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for coming on. So, what have you, um, what, what, what's what been ailing you, Steve? Um, if you if you're happy to let us know, um, you know, drop that in the chat. That would be quite cool. Um, I'm feeling a tiny bit not ill is probably not the right word, but um, <laughs> post post fantastic on weekend today. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a bit weary. Um, there wasn't a great deal of sleep. There was probably a little bit too much alcohol. Um, thank you very much to Frontier actually for um, putting a credit card behind um, 
a bar that was full of mead and other such imbibements. That was quite good. And um, many of us are a little bit the worst away for that. Plus, I had to drive home yesterday as well, which was four and a half hours. <laughs> Today, I had to do a full day's work. Got a bit kind of uh. so. If I lose, if I lose focus or concentration throughout the uh, throughout the stream, that will be why. Um, but um, I will do my best. <laughs> So yeah, living above the polar circle—that is—that is absolute madness. I spent a um, a few weeks up in was it Norway or Finland? Finland, I think. Um, a few years ago, in the winter, and again in the summer, and I was um, just like, <laughs> "How do you cope?" Because <laughs> I remember being there in the summer and thinking, "When's it going to get dark?" <laughs> then realised it wasn't going to. <laughs> <laughs> which kind of freaked me out. And in the winter, it just, you know, you, how, how do you operate with no daylight? I mean, that's just very, very strange, very, 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 very old. Um, so, uh, yes, the void doth draw near an envelope, us, yes. And hello, um, Chris, um, good to see you as well. And Zedek Shadow, yes, good to see you. And, of course, yes, um, Saturday, wasn't it? Um, so, yes, no, I do remember uh, bumping into you. And thank you very much for... Um, for, for taking uh, copies of the Shadewood book. So I'm actually going to be using one of those tonight because we want to talk about dialogue. So you'll be able to read the section. I'll try and avoid spoilers for you in that regard. <laughs> you pinch a small bit. Um, but lovely to meet you as well. Um, oddly enough, conventions, it's probably worth an evening's chat all about itself um, as to you know what happens at conventions and, um, and, and what they're all about in terms of, of writing and things because they're, they're kind of quite important in some ways. Um, oh, did I miss you? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> well, um, we can we can sort that out next year. Absolutely. Yeah, bring them along next year. I will sign them for you. Not a problem. Um, yeah, we had to leave early. It was a bit annoying, actually, on the Sunday, because uh, it turned out they were closing the Dartford Tunnel river crossing, or at least the bridge, uh, which is how you get from Essex into Kent. And if they close that, then the entirety of Kent... <laughs> Again, it becomes inaccessible. So we, we we were told this. So we had to we had to leave the convention a little bit earlier to make sure we got back, which was a bit annoying. Um, but so yeah, so yes, apologies for that. Um, so yeah, so conventions. We we should talk about conventions at some point because um, um, that's all part of the the um, the atmosphere around um, uh, yeah, about writing and and kind of and doing all things because um, once you've written a book. Um, and you know, if you've if you've hopefully done a, a reasonable job of it, and um, actually get some people to write it, which, uh, write it uh, to read it, which is obviously hopefully an objective for you, <laughs> then um, you may bump into some of these real people who actually read books, which can be fascinating actually. And, and one of the things I love about the conventions is just bumping into people and saying, "Oh, I read your book, and you know, this happened and that happened. Or I like this character, or I like that character, and so on and so forth." And actually just discuss with you about some of the stuff that you've put together. The interesting thing there is um, um, that, that, that people just have completely different interpretations of some of the stuff you wrote. Sometimes they get what you were intending quite specifically. <laughs> Real people, no, it doesn't ring really well. Uh, not so. I mean, <laughs> the biggest problem I have is all the wacky usernames. So, you know, um, I've now got to put ZX Shadow Wolf equals Peter somewhere in my brain. <laughs> Because people tend to, in real, not always, but they tend to in real life introduce themselves by their real names, and then of course online they they never, they never use them. I'm very simple; I just use Drew because I can't cope with these funky funky names. Um, but um, so yeah, so connecting those sort of things up. And um, Alpha Epic they have lived well above the Arctic polar circle for ten years, and in the summer you can't get tired, and in the winter you get sleepy really fast. So does it? Oh, that's interesting. Does it actually screw with your biological clock? Wow. Um, so that's so you can actually you're sort of almost photosynthesizing then so you can stay awake because of the daylight because um, I've heard of these things you know the sad I think we call it over here um, something affective disorder to do with daylight um, which is which is interesting actually so um, yeah you have to tell us more about that at some point that's quite cool so where are you actually um, are you actually above the uh, the polar circle now maybe you can chop that in the chat because that's interesting where where are you. Oh, and it's uh, Shadow Wolf as well. That's one thing that confused me during Fantasticon. People would introduce themselves by their commander names. <laughs> yeah, so it, it is difficult. And I have to ask every single time uh, when I'm signing a book for somebody, you know, who do, you, who do I make this out to? Because partly, partly I can't remember all the names I'm supposed to remember. I've got mine like a sieve unless I actually write things down. And the other one is um, um, 
Uh, some people get really upset if you want to use their real name because they want they kind of want to be in cult character. So particularly the elite books, everybody tends to want their commander name being written down rather than their real name. But on the Shadewood stuff, it's the other way around. So we kind of have to keep asking, who do I make this out to? And it's usually Commander Zygonaut or whatever it happens to be. <laughs> so um, that's, that's a strange one. Oh, I've got problems with my stream buffering. That's interesting. Oh, yeah, I'm getting a few dropped frames. That's interesting. Uh, I don't know if that's my internet connection. I have got a wired network here, so I'm hoping that's working. Uh, let's uh, let's hope it settles down. I haven't had a problem with it before, but it is uh, it is looking like it's got a bit of an issue. We'll 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 proceed. Um, but you're anyway Alpha Epic Eleven. You're currently in Norway. Near the Tromsø region, if that rings a bell. I don't know it well. I will go and look it up because I'm actually curious. I am actually curious on that one. So um, let me know if you're still having trouble with the stream. Um, that may be my internet is being problematic. I'm definitely getting some drop frame warnings here. So I'll have to investigate that. It could be my PC. It could be, uh, it could be something else with my internet connection. We'll see how it goes. It looks like it's steady down a little bit now. Um, anyway, we'll carry on. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've actually had a technical, other than me forgetting to switch the mic on, which is obviously my fault. That's the first time I think I've had a slight technical glitch there, so we'll see how it goes. So anyway, so dialogue. Um, tonight's topic. Um, I wanted to go into this one. We kind of touched upon it um, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about description. Now, I am a character author. Now, not everybody is. Um, and... Um, whether the basically depending on the type of story that you're writing, you may want or you may want to put more or less emphasis on on um, on dialogue, because in a character-based story, which is the sort of stuff I do, you're using the dialogue to further the storyline. Basically, you're getting your reader to listen into what the characters are saying and trying to get them to draw um, conclusions based on what the characters are saying and what how they're acting with each other. So that's a character-based story. And um, that may not be the type of author you are. You may want to do a more kind of action-focused story. Um, and um, you may want to you know, drive the story along by action scenes where things are exploding and you know, car chases or whatever it happens to be that you're, you're into. Um, or you may want to do just a sort of description-based, slower-paced kind of story. Now, all those things are valid. You kind of need to decide what it is that you want to do. Um, so, oh, I'm just catching up the track. So, yes, Peter, a real name. And Shadow Wolf is an alias. Yes, I kind of, I kind of hope Shadow Wolf wasn't a real name. It would be cool if it was, actually. <laughs> um, I really have to think about an online um, avatar name. Um, and now for Epic 11, try making online friends and meeting them in real life. Names get very confusing. Sometimes we use real names in real life and other times online names. <laughs> well, I don't know all of your real names either, so that, that can get confusing as well. So I'm, I'm going to just stick to Drew, but you'll know who I am anyway, so that's quite cool. <laughs> but I'll admit, a lot of my, um, uh, one of the first internet people I met, actually he's not on the stream tonight, he sent his apologies, John Hoggard. Um, um, it's just Daddy Hoggy, that's his online Thing. And his avatar on every single forum I spoke to him on was a, was a, was a raven, a massive great big crow type thing. And um, of course in real life um, I, was, I was horrendously disappointed to discover he wasn't a six foot crow. <laughs> and I had these visions that he was. Um, it's, just, um, it's, it's, it's just weird. You kind of get an impression of people. And I met some people on the weekend, and I mustn't, I mustn't, um, I mustn't be cruel to poor, 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 um, poor Yamix. Uh, one of the elite dangerous streamers. I was, I was, I was ear wigging on com a few conversations, and um, I hadn't yet met um, Yamix before. And uh, he was having a conversation with DJ Truth Sarah and Obsidian Ant. So doing a little bit of name dropping, but they they were really they were having a chat, and I was just all joining in. And Yamix to me, <laughs> the problem is when you meet people in real life, they never look like quite how you expect them to look. And uh, Yamix doesn't look anything like how I expected to look. And to be honest, neither does Obsidian Ed or DJ Troopsayer. But um, it's just one of those things. What you know, <laughs> you kind of have this mental image of what people look like, and they're nothing like that. So that was quite funny. Um, but um, XX Death Destroyer seventy six in real life, but uh, yeah. So it's like, where do we get these names? Some of them have some quite interesting stories behind them, but that's yeah, that's that's another topic. Anyway, getting 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 distracted again, which I must I must try and avoid doing. Um, so um, so yeah, so there's 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 multiple different types of uses for dialogue. Now, 
dialogue can be quite um, quite important to what you're trying to do with your story. That could be, like in my case, the dialogue is actually crucial to pushing the story along. I, you're trying to get the reader to listen to what the characters are saying to each other, and then, if possible, drop clues into the conversation so that the reader's going, hang on, why did he say that? Why did she respond like that? Does that mean there's some subtext going on between these two and yada, yada, yada? Could be um, you're just getting the characters to kind of explain what's going on so the reader can can do it. That can be less compelling. It can be more compelling depending on the type of story you're doing. Now, to give you an example of this sort of stuff, I'm actually going to choose um, um, one of my favorite books, actually. So this is an absolute classic science fiction. I'm sure some of you will know this one. This is Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rammer. Probably, well, actually, um, I think this is his best book. Um, it's, I think it's better than 2001, which obviously which is his most famous work, having been made into a film and everything. Um, but this one, I think, is his, is his kind of his, his absolute masterpiece. I can still read this. I must have read this 10, 15, 20 times by now. And every time I read it, I can suspend the disbelief, even though I know exactly what happens in the book. I can read it again and just enjoy it again, completely without without a problem, even though I've, it's, it's, it's very spot. So uh, if you haven't read it, Chris, this... I would absolutely recommend it, this one. Um, so um, for those of you who don't know it, um, this is a, it's a sort of first contact story, really. So basically what happens is that um, uh, um, the epilogue, not the epilogue, the prologue, a, um, an asteroid hits the Earth and it wipes out. I think it's Vienna or somewhere in Italy and you know completely pulverizes it. And um, you know in true Arthur C. Clarke, fashion it's done quite sort of dispassionately from a distance and um, humanity sort of in the I think it's late 21st century or early 22nd century from what I recall uh, yeah so it's 20 uh, yeah 20 early 21st uh, 22nd century basically the science you know we're not going to get hit by asteroids again we're going to have a proper sort of space defense program and so they set all this space defense program up looking for asteroids and they encounter they discover this strange asteroid on a very odd elliptical orbit which is coming from outside of the solar system and um, they divert a space probe to it and it turns out not to be an asteroid it turns out to be this vast I don't know if you can see that very well with the glare from the camera there you go uh, this vast cylindrical spaceship and they christen it Rammer and um, basically once they realize it's an alien spaceship, um, they go and investigate it. And it's the story of that expedition. And um, it, is, it is very, very good. So if you like kind of hard sci-fi, there's no anti-gravity or you know, force fields or lasers or anything like that in this book. This is, this is pure classic hard science fiction um, from 1974-ish, something like that. Um, and it's a fabulous, fabulous book. So even though I'm going to use it as an example of bad luck, that bad dialogue in a moment. <laughs> Seemed a bit unfair. Um, um, but it is brilliant. It's an absolutely belter of a science fiction story, so don't miss out on it um, for, for those reasons. It's not, as you can see, it's not huge either. It's, um, how many pages long is it? Mm, 250, and it's, so it's, it's, you know, you can read it fairly quickly, a couple of weeks tops, even if you're, even if you're busy. Fabulous, fabulous story. But Arthur C. Clarke, uh, um, and he's dead now, so we can... <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about him, um, you know, kind of uh, a little bit after. Absolutely brilliant science fiction author. I mean, you can't, you really can't disagree with that. Uh, and, oh, Childhood's End. Um, yes, I've got that one here, I think. Mm, where is it? Childhood's End. Yeah, I actually, actually, no, I haven't. The one I'm thinking of is that one. Um, this is uh, my other favourite, Arthur C. Clark. Songs of Distant Earth. So that's a good one. That's actually slightly better dialogue-wise. Um, and, but Childhood's End is good as well. Um, um, Arthur C. Clarke um, you know, really knew his science. So he did that properly. He didn't you know, put stuff in. So you know, spaceships don't make noise in space. Um, you know, they all have proper orbits. And you know, he does the astrophysics of science fiction, if you like, properly. He doesn't muck about with that sort of stuff. But he was never a great character author. So um, in this book, you have a team of, of, you know, a crew for this, this little spaceship that goes to visit the alien. Um, and they're all kind of consummate professional types. You know, they know their jobs. They do their jobs. 
um, and they're good at their jobs. They'd never really argue. <laughs> they never they never Mickey take each other. They never interact in a way that you would kind of think, you know, people would. They are they're quite featureless. They're not important really to the plot. The plot is all about this alien spaceship, um, which they're trying to investigate. So they're not in some ways they're not important um, to telling this story, and it shows in the way that the dialogue works. So I'm going to give you a this is this hopefully won't be a spoiler. Um, so I'm going to just read a little bit of it. I can't go too much, obviously, copyright, but um, I want to give you an example of the type of dialogue that's in this book so we can compare and contrast. Um, so this is actually from Chapter 16. As you know perfectly well, Dr. Pereira, said Ambassador Bose in a tone of patient resignation, few of us share your knowledge of mathematical meteorology, so please take pity on our ignorance. With pleasure, answered the exobiologist, quite unabashed. I can explain it best by telling you what is going to happen inside Rama very soon. The temperature is now about to rise as the solar heat pulse reaches the interior. According to the latest information I've received, it's already above freezing point. The cylindrical sea will soon start to thaw, and unlike bodies of water on Earth, it will melt from the bottom upwards. That may produce some odd effects, but I'm much more concerned with the atmosphere. As it's heated, the air inside Rama will expand and it will attempt to rise towards the central axis. And this is the problem. At ground level, although it's apparently stationary, it's actually sharing the spin of Rama over 800 kilometers an hour. And as it rises towards the axis, it will try and retain that speed. And it won't be able to do, of course. The result will be violent winds and turbulence. I estimate the velocities of two between two and 300 kilometers an hour. And I'll stop at that point. Um, so, What's happening here is you've got an exobiologist and an ambassador, and the ambassador doesn't know anything about science, and the exobiologist, um, oddly enough here, is talking about meteorology, but there we go. Um, he's sitting there in this sort of conference room explaining. <laughs> now, that is, that's a valid thing to be doing at this point in the story um, because, you know, it, the question has been asked. It's a sort of pseudo-scientific conference they're at, and this guy is an expert. But um, to do that in dialogue like that is, is not a character-driven story. Let's put it like that. That's probably the easiest way to say it. What you're doing is effectively you're doing an info dump. You're explaining what is about to happen to the reader through the words of a, um, you know, a character in the book. Now, this, this exobiologist... Um, is only mentioned by name a couple of times. So you, you've not really got any emotional attachment to him um, because he doesn't actually have any emotions in the story. Um, he's just there to tell the reader what is about to happen so that as he begins to describe it in, a, in, the, in the following bits and pieces, um, you know, you've got some grounding in the science behind it. So what's happened here is you've, you've kind of been told what's going to, be, going to be happen. You've been given a bit of scientific explanation as to why. So when you actually read the next bit of the story, you're not really surprised when you see the atmospheric effects that the, uh, the good uh, exobiologist doctor has been telling us about. Now, if you're writing a hard science fiction novel, that's, that's okay. Um, and, and then the, the chap goes on to compare and contrast with Earth and uh, how it works at the equator with the Coriolis spin of the trade winds. And, you know, if you're into your hard sci-fi, that's fine. I've spoken to quite a few astrophysicists, and if you sit them down in a conference room and get them to explain something, they <laughs> sometimes they do sound exactly like this. So it's probably quite authentic. But it doesn't make for a great story. And in general, if you sit and observe even very you know, highly qualified um, you know, astrophysicists or all this sort of stuff, they don't tend to talk in long paragraphs like that. Um, they will stop and they will um and they will, well, I suppose, let me think about that for a moment. You know, they'll, they'll interject things. So if you're trying to make your dialogue sound a bit more authentic, um, then you know, you've got to break it up. People tend to work in very, very short sentences uh, in that regard. Now, Clark was never, never a dialogue person, so I'm being a little bit unfair to him picking on him like that, but it's quite a good example of a great book, which um, in some ways you could tweak and have, you know, play around with um, and create more characterization with. But you... Um, you mustn't do that because this was followed up by three sequels, I think, and they're all rubbish, in my humble opinion. 
because they weren't written by Arthur C. Arthur C. Clarke, they were written by a chap um, whose name escapes me now. Um, Gentry Lee, who actually is a very good character author, but the follow-on books of this had those kind of characterizations in them, which made the characters quite interesting, but completely blew away all the hard science fiction. So um, it's a double-edged sword. Now, this is, a, this is quite an interesting comparison. So I love this book. I can see its flaws from a dialogue perspective in the way it's done. But when those flaws were addressed by writing with another author, in this case, Gentry Lee, um, I can see what they did, and they brought the characters to life, but they completely trashed the essence of what Clark had done in this original book. So you've got to be very careful. What type of book are you writing? I always keep coming back and saying things like that. What type of book are you writing? Because this works beautifully, despite the fact the dialogue is very, very clunky. Um, so there's an example. Um, so it just goes to show that this is never a cut and dried, that's right, this is wrong. Um, you can't do it like that. So anyway, if you haven't read it, do do give um, Rendezvous with Rama um, a, um, a, a shot. It's a great, great story. Now, I'm going to pinch a bit from um, one of my own books because I think it's only fair that I use some of my own work to compare and contrast. Now, I'm not saying this is a master class in dialogue, um, but I've chosen a scene here from um, one of the later chapters, I think. Where am I? About three quarters of the way through this, so hopefully I won't spoil it too much if you haven't read this story. Um, but I want to... Um, um, choose a bit here that's kind of got some dialogue in it um, that is deliberately trying to tell you, the reader, that something fishy is going on, um, which the characters don't necessarily know. So, yes, yeah, slight spoiler alert, but uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't break up the flow because I don't think you'll be able to make sense of it if you don't know what the story is. But you'll get the you get the essence of it. So, at, at this point, we've got um, two uh, two lady characters, Zoella and Liana, and uh, another chap. Uh, by the name of Turgon, who's effectively rescued them at this point and is kind of leading them onwards. Um, and La Liana is, um, is is asleep. She's kind of slumped over the back of this beast of burden as this as this scene opens. Um, and let's see if we can... I'm going to read a page from this and we'll sort of um, contrast it. So, Zoella heard a moan from behind her and turned to see Liana sitting upright on the back of a gargoyle. My quick... Turgon looked at her, and she stopped, and then moved close to Liana. Uh, sister, she said brightly, are you, are you feeling better? Liana looked at her, bewildered for a moment, before looking around herself in surprise. What am I? Sister? She looked back at Zoella with a confused expression on her face. You've been ill, sister, Zoella said, giving her a pointed look, ensuring it was hidden from Turgon. Oh, Liana swallowed and sat up. Yes, uh, much better. She looked at Turgon. This was your doing? She asked. He's helping us, so Ella said, taking us to Nereus. Liana sniffed. And how far is it to this Nereus? Turgon stepped forward. Not far. Five stretches of walking, perhaps. Liana climbed down from the back of the gargoyle and stretched. You have my thanks. What's your name? Zoella winced. Liana's accent was far more refined than hers. Turgon seemed amused. Turgon Gurn, my lady. He bowed with an exaggerated flourish. I would talk with uh, my sister in private. Turgon bowed and retreated out of earshot. What are you doing? Liana hissed. We can't trust him, a strange man out of the wilderness. I had no choice, Zoella returned. He found you before I did. You were hurt. He tended to you. He's taking us to near us. That's where we need to go. We can trust him. And how would you know that? There's no deception. Well, I'll be the judge of that. What's he asked for in payment for all this assistance of his? So Ella looked blank. He said he was going that way anyway. There's nothing free in this world, Liana said. No metal, no coin promised. So Ella shook her head. So what does he want? He doesn't want anything. He keeps no possessions. Liana shook her head and let her scoff. Then watch him carefully. We're heading for this city. What's it called? Nereus. It's the capital of Drem. There's a council which orders the place. We can make our case there and ask for help. Warn them of the danger. It isn't far away. And this man you spoke of, that my father told you to seek? So well, I swallowed. His name's Geron. He was my guardian when I was a child. And it was he who hid the girls away. King Oric. And she paused, a pained expression coming across her feature. King Oric told me to find him. 
Maybe he can help us. I'll stop there. Too many spoilers, but there we go. <laughs> so that scene was basically, um, you've got Zoella and Liana um, and this Turgan chap, and they don't know whether they can trust him. And I'm trying to give you, the reader, the impression whether or not you think you can trust him either. So he hasn't said very much here, but clearly these two ladies are playing a bit of a game because, um, um, you know, quite obviously to you, the reader, they're not um, sisters. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, but it's written in such a way, the aim being that Turgon at this point may or may not know that they're lying to him and they're trying to pull the wool over his eyes a little bit. Hence the kind of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, what, you know, make sure you call me sister. And they're, and they're not sisters. Um, so what I've tried to do in there, if you listen to it, if you've noticed on the way through, is the dialogue is actually quite short. So the first bit is actually um, my... She's almost about to say queen, because that's the relationship these two actually do have, and she kind of just stops. So it's quite okay to put bits of words into dialogue. So if I show you that bit, that's how it's actually written in the story. Where is it? Mm. There, if you can see that. My quit. <laughs> um, because people will will start talking. And I've always subscribed to the view that if you listen and, and listen to people when they talk, they will they will go, you know when the, um, oh, the, uh, what's that thing called? You know, the dialogue will, um, you know, normal speech will wander around all over the shop. A bit like my streams. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, it, so it's quite, it's quite sensible to put in broken words, like bits of words. So she was going to say, my queen, because that's how she's used to addressing her in this scene. And then she just as she's uttering the first syllable, she's realizing, I mustn't, I mustn't give that away, because that could be used against us. Because you know, if I reveal she's royalty, then that's going to affect, you know, yeah, maybe we'll get ransomed or something like that. And that's the sort of thought process I'm trying to make you, the reader, go through. Go, ah, yeah, she's got to be careful what she says here. Um, and... Um, then you've got the you know the um, you know the other bits and pieces, the little pauses. Now, strictly speaking, I use a, I use a lot of these, and you'll see this in my work. I do get told off for it, and it isn't grammatically correct. So, one of the things that you can do as a writer is once you've learned the rules, you can break them. <laughs> um, so, I use a lot of these. Um, you can see that that's an ellipse, which is three dots. And an ellipse has a very very strong grammatical sense, which almost everybody ignores nowadays. Uh, and I must admit, off the top of my head, I can't remember what you're supposed to use them for. I must admit, I use them a lot for dialogue pauses. Um, so if you want to get something across to your reader that there's a slight dramatic pause in the dialogue, you can use dot, 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 or the ellipse to kind of just put a breathy pause in there. So um, in this case, it's uh, um, Zoella's done the, are you feeling better, sister? Kind of hint, 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 such, you know, uh, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, and then Leona's responding with, what, what, what am I? And then dot, 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 giving you the reader. Oh, she's kind of confused. She's pausing. Sister? Question mark. Um, which gives you the, um, you know, a rhythm to the dialogue, which sometimes it's quite hard to do. But if you're trying to get some nuances in, like, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about here, um, into the actual dialogue that your characters are talking about. Um, because if you listen to dialogue, and it's, it's, if you listen to people talking in supermarkets or you listen anywhere to people having a chat, you'll notice that they stop and they start and they um and they err. Uh. Now, I'm not saying you should litter your dialogue with ums and errs, but you need to, if you want to have natural sounding dialogue, then you need to make it kind of jolt and start and stop a little bit. And that may be, that's another way you can differentiate your characters, because some characters will be very measured in the way that they talk and they will explain things with clarity, and they will take their time over the words that they use. Other characters will just, uh, well, yeah, you know what I want to get across? I wanna, I'm want i really excited about this. Yeah, and, and this thing happened to me the other day, and it's, what was I talking about again? You can differentiate your characters by the type of dialogue that they use. And your readers will get used to the way the character acts and speaks as well. So each character can have a voice through the dialogue, which helps distinguish them and makes the characters that much more um, you know, interesting because you go, oh, I know who's talking now because they always talk like that and they get excited and they get a bit carried away or they're very measured and they're very you know, laid back and they always think about what they're saying before they say it. 
Um, so all of those things are quite good. The other big thing about dialogue is all those rules of grammar that you've, we've gone through in the past streams and you have to obey in the description and you have to obey in the action scenes and all that good stuff, you can chuck it all away. <laughs> um, yeah, and you're exactly right, Alpha Epic, uh, their social status. You know, you, that's another way to differentiate it. So some people will use a lot of long words because they're posh and they're well-educated. Other people won't have that vocabulary. So their dialogue should be um, you know, much, much more basic. Um, so yeah, so um, I've kind of done that a little bit um, with, with, with these two actually, um, is that uh, Liana is of a higher social standing than Zoella is, so she speaks better, basically. <laughs> uh, and you can use that to differentiate your characters as well. That's quite good. Um, so yeah, so, but the other thing is when you listen, when, when people are speaking in dialogue, um, they don't have to obey rules of grammar. Um, because generally people don't when they're speaking. Um, so you can use abbreviations, you can hesitate, you can say things that are grammatically wrong if that's the way that that person speaks. Um, so you know you can break all those grammatical rules inside dialogue, um, but just be careful how you do it because it um, it can jolt the reader if it's if it's really really bad. Uh, it depends on the person uh, that you're trying to represent. So um, I've got a character here, a little bit later on, a young lad um, uh, who who doesn't really use. Um, yeah, his 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 speaking is a bit is broken. It's not his first language. So um, if I read a tiny little bit of him, um, yeah, let's just let's choose a bit uh, if I can find it. Who are you, Ren? Ren Tacker, the boy replied. And what are you doing in the forest? The boy's eyes welled up with tears. Homestead burnt in the scorching. All dead. Just me. He's very like that. So he just is punchy, short. Here's the information you need. Nothing embellishing it at all. And Because it's not his first language, so he's a bit kind of, um, you know, he's trying to find his way with his guys as he, as he talks to them. So all those bits of dialogue you can you can use to distinguish your characters um, and um, you know break apart the, the flow of the story and get people to realize who's talking the other thing you've got here is is the classic um, um, identifying who is talking now if you've got two characters it's pretty straightforward because you say who started talking and then when the other person's talking it's obviously them um, so uh, you know, if it's if it's let's say say it's, it's Jane and it's Bill, Jane started talking by, "How are you?" Bill says, "I'm fine, thank you, Jane." Um, so what's going on? Uh, well, I'm you know I've been at work today. Oh, what was work like? Oh, it was pretty dreadful. There's a toing and froing with two people in conversation, which is easy for a reader to follow. Once you get to three or even more, if you get a scene where there's quite a few people in there. Um, it becomes more public because you have to tell the reader who's talking. And that can get a bit clunky quite quickly because um, you tend to have a, uh, a um, so John said, and then Clive said, and then um, Jane says, and then Mary says, and you kind of, you get all these, these person said, person said, person said in your book. And a lot of um, authors, um, you know, particularly new writers, actually fall into the trap of, right, I can't keep using the word said because there's this kind of instinct in your brain going, I'm, I'm using the word said too much. I keep saying said, 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 and it looks horrible on the page, which is true. So what they tend to do, um, one of the kind of classic early writing mistakes is to replace the word said with anything <laughs> possible. So you get whispered, shouted, um, uh, uh, what, what are the other ones? Um, Expectorated is a is a classic, really really bad one. <laughs> <laughs> Laughed, giggled, chuckled, um, appeased. You know, there's all sorts of variations you can use, um, and um, people try and disguise the word said by um, by replacing it with anything, um, anything at all. Oh, and thank you for um, 
for doing whatever you just did there, Mr. Shadow Wolf. That's great. Peter, thank you very much. Um, so, um, and that's actually a classic error, replied. Replied is a good one. Like you can get away with a replied because sometimes people have asked a question and asked, actually. If it's a question, um, you can get away with asked. But there's really only a few of those you can do. And you really want to be um, quite um, restrictive on them. Don't go mad on all the um, alternatives to said. An, a, an editor will go through them um, and, and strip them all out. Um, and, and you're quite right, um, Alfred, yeah, but, you know, in a conversation, people will bat things back and forth. It's not, there's not an equal amount of time um, for each individual character. Some people will dominate the conversation. This is going back to you knowing your characters. If you put, let's say you've got a scene where five of your main characters are in, a, in, a, in the same area and they're having an argument or a discussion, what are their characters going, how, that, how is that going to drive the dialogue? Now, a really good example of this, for me, and I got a copy of it on my bookshelf. I can't believe I don't. <laughs> uh, I might have to pop it up on the script. Let me see if I can find it, because it might be helpful for you to look at it, actually. Uh, let's go back to the desktop, then. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, right, so let's pop this up here. I'm going to pick a scene from uh, Premonition, actually, to to do this one. Uh, where are we? Do, 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 books. Elite. Dangerous. Premonition. Final. There we go. So there's a scene, if you haven't, again, if you haven't read Premonition, apologies for potential spoilers here. Um, but I think most of you would have done who are interested in it. I'm just trying to remember where this occurred. Uh, it's fairly late on. I think. Bear with me a moment. It's not that late. Let's be a bit earlier than that. Yeah, this is it. So there's a scene halfway through um, Premonition where basically the children of Raxlow are trying to um, uh, uh, basically get everybody onto their side. And I've got basically every man and his dog in this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Virtually everybody who was pro Salome in the elite story um, was there. So this this is how the scene opens. Um, Eremus took a deep breath, and hopefully some of you actually know Commander Eremus. You may you may have seen him online. Um, he was climatized to public speaking, and it had been necessary enough times in the past. One didn't drive the actions of a faction by hiding in the shadows, and nor was it a role for the timid. But this was going to be a sternest test. They had come from across the chart. Factions aligned with the Empire had responded to the invitation. The HR 6421 system was buzzing with ships, and comm lines were running, running at capacity. So I've got um, basically the whole cast of the children of Raxley here. I've got people from Lorenz Legion. I've got people from the League of Star Pilots. I've got um, Ailing's Angels and the Prismatic Imperium. Uh, I've got um, <laughs> Spinwood Marches Alliance, Palladium Consortium, Da Vinci Corp, Winged Hussars, Chapter House Inquisition. The list goes on. It was a massive, 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 massive meeting. And it kind of actually happened in real life, kind of in a meta, meta sense. Um, we've even got um, the Sovereignty, which obviously is Mr. DJ Truthsayer and his crew, which is, which is all quite good fun. Um, and um, so I've got a massive cast here. So how do I, how do, I do it? Um, so what I've done in this particular scene is Eremus is the man, he's basically the, the chairperson of this meeting. And so what I use, I use him to anchor the action in order to, so that you as the reader have got a kind of position um, as to what's going on. Um, and uh, as we go through it, um, and I have to be a little bit careful here because some of the people I don't, um, I can't introduce immediately. They start talking before I've had a chance to bring them into the story. So here's um, Penny Umbra. No doubt about it, said the woman standing immediately behind Lyrie. Eremus recognized the face of Penny Umbra. So I'm using Eremus. 
audience viewpoint that you're the reader looking through at this point to um, bring those characters in and kind of introduce them one by one. So Eremus gives a little bit of a lecture to start with and then recognizes people so that the next piece of dialogue is coming from the person that Eremus has just been kind of making eye contact with. So it's, it's, it, it's quite hard. This was a really tricky scene to do. Um, and then I'm trying to inject the kind of characterization into dialogue. So if those of you who've watched DJ Truthsayer's, see, uh, do, bleh, DJ Truthsayer's streams and the stuff that his sovereignty gets up to, knows he likes to kind of big himself up a bit. I don't think I'm being unfair to him by saying that. Um, and so when I put him into dialogue, the Empire's sick, and we of the sovereignty have said this all along, DJ said. It's rotten to the very core. Our leader, on he goes. And he, you know, he'll never stop unless somebody shuts him up, which, of course, is what happens in the next line. Spare us the self-promotion, replied a rough-looking man. And then Eremus looked at, you know, so I'm bringing the characters in very hard. Now, you, the reader, are looking through Eremus's eyes at this mass of figures, and that you're kind of using Eremus here as the anchor point for me to explain who's doing what. Um, so that was, a, that was a complicated kind of scene which I needed to use the dialogue to differentiate the different commanders, come up with some kind of um, style for them, um, and kind of go on from there. So that's, that's, an uh, that's a complicated example. Now, I have broken a few of my own rules in this one, which, again, I, I've just told you, don't try and do too many alternatives to said. But what you'll notice here is I've actually used bits of description to break up the dialogue. So um, Eremus tried to regain the initiative, and he raised his voice. Then he starts speaking. Um, people point fingers across the table. That breaks the dialogue up. Um, another man pushed forward. A little bit of description as to what he looks like. So you're kind of you're kind of trying to break up the flow there. Um, I've used replied, and I have used said there. Um, I've also I think I spotted a counted down here somewhere. Where did that go? Mm. There we are. Eremus countered. So I am bringing a little bit of variety in because I need to use all of these tools sparingly to kind of break up this scene and, and make it work. Um, and then I also use that internal monologue voice, which is very characteristic of the way I try and do things. So here you've got a, almost like a privileged frame of reference for Eremus. You're kind of going inside his head for a moment. Uh-oh, here we go. Trouble ahead. Um, and the reason for that is Corwin Ryan was the head of the Prismatic Imperance, a powerful political nobody that held the system of QBO on behalf of Princess Ashling. Uh, and they were far bigger and more powerful than the children of Raxler. So you, you know, Eremus knows he's dicing with a, a, a very, very powerful political enemy at this point. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, a little bit of privilege inside, a, inside Eremus's head. And then, um, good question. But I don't need a said at this point because we're in Eremus's head. So we know he's speaking. So you can ditch the saids and the counters and the replies and the asks if we haven't switched characters' perspective. So you can still stream things on the, um, um, in and out, uh, all those sort of things. So um, apologies for a slight self-advert on, um, on the dialogue there. But that's, those are the way to deal with the more complicated scenes. If you don't need um, to differentiate it. And you know, if you can start by not having massive, massive meetings, it probably helps because <laughs> they're quite hard to write um, and, and, keep, and keep the dialogue flowing. Uh, Drew, do you ever spend time in public places sitting and listening to people talk just to get to this? Yes, I do. Um, it is incredibly, incredibly important. There's lots of things that jump out to you when you listen to people talking. Um, and tr I try not to do it in a creepy sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening to your conversation. Um, or, and for God's sake, don't record anything. You know, you're not allowed to do that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, listening, just, you know, just as you're wandering around in the shops or um, you know, if you're sitting in a queue at a, you know, a KFC or something like that, just listen to the way people are talking. You'll be quite surprised if you analyze it. There's a few, few golden rules that I've kind of picked up over time. One, people never, ever refer to each other by name because they already know who they are. So you never get, oh, John, uh, what would you like from the KFC menu today? You, know, you, you don't get that. <laughs> John and his, his mate know each other, so they never, ever use their names. So there's no need to use your names in a, an informal setting in a story because people will never, ever, uh, will, will ever do it. Um, <laughs> yes, do it in cafes or places where you won't stand out like a nut. Yeah, you've got, <laughs> you've got to be a bit subtle about it. Um, the other thing is people are always always interrupting each other. They never, ever wait for the end of the next person's sentence before they start talking. And 
um, sometimes you know people will s will f you'll be listening to them and, and the conversation will be quite natural and they'll be chatting away but they will be interrupting each other all the oh yeah yeah I saw that film that was really good what did you think of the uh, you know you know the bit when the um you know the the, you know, the um yeah, the guy got the gun. Oh, yeah, the guy with the gun. Oh, that was awesome, wasn't it? Yeah. And do you remember? Yeah, but where, 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 what about the thing with the, um, what about the axe? You know, the axe was awesome. Oh, the axe, man. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, I love the axe. Yeah. They will keep doing that. That's how dialogue naturally flows when people are talking. And you can't always capture that in a book. But um, my advice on that is you know, don't, don't get your characters to address each other by name because it just looks really weird when you're reading it. Um, Keep the sentences short. Hardly anybody has time in a conversation to do their, well, let me just explain the plot. We're here in KFC. <laughs> it sounds like a radio broadcast setting the scene, and it's not how people speak. Uh, so yeah, things like that yeah, you can definitely avoid. Um, and um, people use contractions, and they use slang quite a lot as well. Obviously, you know, in certain places they're going to use profanity and you know, and swearing and all sorts of stuff. And that, that depends on the situation you're trying to write. Um, if people are being threatened or they're shy or you know, they're, you know, they're in love or all those sort of things, all of those things are going to alter the dialogue quite dramatically. Um, so, you know, you can get some very sloppy um, kind of, you know, um, um, uh, you know, affectionate speak if you get a couple who are obviously in love. Um, you can get people who are, uh, are vying off each other against trying to be superior. That will change the dialogue quite noticeably. And the beautiful thing from a writing perspective is you can use the dialogue to tell the reader what the relationship is between the two people. Um, yeah, so you can you can do all sorts of stuff like that in the dialogue, which is what I try and do. So you know, you know, you can get a kind of rumbling, threatening kind of behaviour. Um, uh, you know, so I kind of, there's a bit of an example here, actually. So Eremus is obviously trying to get these people on our side, but Corwin here knows he's in a position of power because he's got a bigger political faction. And he just says, so what are you going to do with the data you recovered? Children of Raxler don't have the most honest of reputations. Some brand new terrorists, and I tend to agree with them. So he's being kind of bolshy. He's being threatening. He's being, yeah, come on, come on, Eremus. Prove that you're worthy to me. So he's putting himself in a position of superiority over Eremus and saying, yeah, come on then, bring it. And um, Eremus has got to placate him. He's, he needs this guy's help um, and he has to get him on side. So there's a power imbalance between these two characters which comes out in the dialogue and you, you can use the same sort of thing. Um, and yeah, people talk with references. So this is important with... Um, um, so that's, yeah, it's a great comment, Alpha Epic. Um, this is important with the locale and the situation you're in. So if you're in a contemporary setting, you can set it in the time that you're in, or you can use language cues to set the location. So if you use slang that's around now, then you'll date yourself to 2018. If you use slang from the 90s, you'll put yourself in the 90s, and the 80s and the 70s and whatever it happens to be. In a sci-fi world, you've got to then figure out what's the slang for you know, the, the world that you're in at this point in time. Now that can be quite tricky because you don't want to overplay that. Um, so I've chucked in a few bits into my elite stuff. So you'll you'll have seen things like um, um, goid, which is like short for thargoid, which is just a general kind of chuck away expletive. You stupid goid, you know, <laughs> trying to kind of vaguely make that acceptable slang. Slang in science fiction is really, really hard to do well. So I would recommend you avoid it unless you really need a few words. So I've only got very light pepperings of it in mind because it's kind of making up swear words never is never... <laughs> it's never a good thing, really. It's quite hard to do and make it sound authentic. Um, if um, Some of the better examples are things like Frack from Battlestar Galactica, if you remember that one. Um, there are a few bits and pieces like that that don't sound too bad. They're short and they're punchy and they, you kind of know what they're, they're saying. Um, but, um, you know, the classic one that's obviously um, shot to death in... Um, oh, which film is it? The, the Star Trek spoof. Um, but, you know, by Grabthar's Hammer... <laughs> <laughs> it's so naff, it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, you don't want to be, you, yeah, you, you don't want your characters going by Grabthar's hammer in a, in a serious sort of science fiction, straight fantasy setting. Um, and um, by his use, you know, it just sounds crazy. <laughs> My word. <laughs> so you've got to pepper those things in quite carefully. Um, but if you get them right, then they then they add to the setting. So in Shadewood, for example, I've got this um, red dwarf sun and the planet's tidally locked so we haven't got day and night and all those kind of things so i've tried to use things like scorching 
and shards and other bits and pieces like that to kind of give you a sense of the planet in the language. You've got to be very careful not to overplay that one because um, it can come across really quite naff and it may put your reader off if they go, oh, it's a made-up swear word again. Um, it sounds horrible. Um, and some people really don't like it. Some people are okay with it. You know, so you, you kind of got to know your audience a little bit on that one. Um, so, um, you know, and, and throwaway things. I mean, in Elite, for example, uh, phrases like right on commander have entered the, the lexicon of Elite, and you can use them without it jarring. Um, and uh, in the original novella from Elite, there was the phrase the iron ass, which actually in English sounds awful because we tend to say ass rather than ass. <laughs> Um, and uh, it sounds a bit American for our ears, but um, an iron ass in the original novella was a was a ship that was well kitted out and you know stuff like that as well. So you know it's all sorts of things like that. Um, and insults, insults are is a really really hard one because you can use contemporary stuff and everyone kind of knows what you're going. Um, Star Trek actually lampooned that brilliantly in the um, the um, uh, the voyage home where he goes. Um, you get out of my... Yeah, they're, they're basically, they're trying to cross the street and they almost get run over by the taxi driver and the taxi driver just yells, you dumbass, like that. And Captain Kirk kind of wants to respond in kind. So he goes, well, a, a, a double dumbass on you. <laughs> it's beautifully out of context. It's really, really good. Um, but trying to get your characters to swear generally and insult each other is um, it's quite hard. So, you know, be careful. It, you know, you, you set a tone for novel and those kind of things. So, yeah, that's that's quite good fun. <laughs> um but, you know, the way people speak, and this is exactly the point I think you're making out for Epic, that, you know, the way people speak is a big part of their character. So if you can get your dialogue between each individual very distinct, then you're well on the way to the breaking up the characterization of the individual people. Now, the golden rule that I use for, for dialogue is um, I, just, I just write it down as it's coming out of my head. And then I'll leave it for a bit and then I'll go and tidy it up and maybe tweak a few bits and pieces. The trick is, you if you want your dialogue to sound genuine, you've got to read it back. And you've got to read it back out loud in front of a mirror. And I have to do this with my books. It takes me a while. <laughs> so you're going to feel, I have to say, you're going to feel pretty darn It was bad enough for actually reading in front of a webcam, with, but at least I know there's somebody at the other end who's listening. Um, with um, um, you know, it, when you're reading back stuff that you've done in front of a mirror, um, or just reading it out loud to yourself, you're going to feel very, very self-conscious to start with. But what you'll get out of that process is, if if as you're reading it out loud, you think people don't speak like that, what am I doing? Um, then you'll know what you're trying to say with those characters' words. And it will help you adjust what you've written to make it sound more authentic, actual spoken stuff. So if you speak the dialogue out, it becomes automatically better. So, um, I mean, I, I've changed a lot of dialogue in here. Um, so, um, yeah, there's, there's a bit here, actually. Um, I can't remember who's talking here. Oh, two other characters. I don't need to introduce them. Um, does it hurt? Little, but not much. I'm fine. What about you? Crunch the head, I'll survive. What about the ship? They're, you know, just getting to the point. If I'd written it, does it hurt? And the next guy would come back with, yes, it hurts quite a bit, actually. It's, it's jolly sore. Um, but I'm OK. Uh, what about the ship? It's, you know, it's the same stuff, but it's not how people speak. You've got to abbreviate, shorten, crisp it all up. And... Um, um, you know, just get people to sound natural. And the only way to make your dialogue sound natural, in my experience, is to read it out loud. Because as you're reading, you go, ah, that sounds horrible. What? Yeah, yeah. And you'll, you'll instantly get a kind of, no, I've got to tweak that. And it will usually, you'll usually find that you've written something that's too long. Um, and um, you'll notice people don't speak in great big long paragraphs generally. So if you want to do, you know, something... It, you know, along the same lines as what I do in that sort of sense. Um, uh, and try and get your characters to be characters that drive the story. And I'm a character author, so you you may not be. Um, but um, if, if you if you do want to do things that sort of way, then the dialogue is, is so important. So you can break the rules of grammar, because you're P 
people can speak however the hell you like them. You know, want them to speak. They can be posh. They can be rude. They can be, you know, they can be wordy. They can be, you know, really shy and hardly say anything at all. But when they do say something, it's important. Um, you know, they can they can mumble. They can get things wrong. So this was always actually an interesting thing with um, uh, elite reclamation when people were kind of discussing whether or not um, something in the book was law or not, because you know overall the book is based on 100% law. But a character saying something might be right, might be wrong. Now, it's not that I'm deliberately misleading them, but the characters don't necessarily know the whole plot either. So the characters in the stories aren't operating from 100% knowledge of what the story is about. Otherwise, they could just go straight to the end and solve the mystery, couldn't they? So the characters are figuring that out along the way. So what they say could be wrong. And so you can play with those sort of things and misdirect the reader a little bit by the characters going off down the wrong thing because they're only reacting to the information that they have to hand at that point in the story. So all those things you can kind of pull in together. So dialogue is really, really important for characterization. It's really important to... Um, Try and be authentic with it. I really like to try and make my writing as if you were reading it. Now, if you've got any ambition to have your books or writing turned into TV or a film, you're far better off starting with dialogue that is um, as close to possible as people actually speak. Um, this um, this book, sadly, um, going back to Arthur Clark, this has never been made into a film yet. So I know they were trying to do it, and this one hasn't happened yet. Um, I think it would make a great film. But it's a million miles away from this book to a screenplay that represents this story um, because it just isn't written in, in, in that kind of way. Now, if, um, if some lucky um, um, producer would like to make a, a, a TV series or a film of one of my books, um, it, it would be easier to convert it to a screenplay because the dialogue is written much more like that. That's just the way I've done it. And that's not because I was prepping it with, um, for TV or anything. It's just that's the way I tend to write. Um, the, the gap between those two ends is, is not um, yeah, is not quite so different. So, um, dialogue is important for characterization. It's important for moving the story along potentially. It's important for giving information to the readers. Sometimes there's a little bit of exposition, but don't do too much of it. You don't want your characters to go, ah, oh, well, this is the this is the MacGuffin version three, which does this. And if you plug it into this, it does this, 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 and this. And if we plug it over there, it gives us a map which takes us to the ultimate destination. Don't use your characters to info dump. That's not a good use of them. Um, you can do tiny bits of them if something does need explaining. Um, but try and avoid that. You know, they need to be going, um, you know, th they're in the scene. Um, they should be bewildered, they should be lost, they should be confused, and their dialogue should should kind of explain those kind of things. You can use the dialogue to get across the way they're feeling. So if they're sad, they're not going to be talkative too much, or they're going to be quite emotional as they speak, uh, or they may ramble, or they may overcompensate in lots of different ways if they're scared or they're terrified or they're in love. All those sort of emotions you can get across in the dialogue. And you can use it to distinguish between the two the different types of people that you have in the story. Um, you know, So you've got um, people who are loquacious, people who hardly say anything at all, people who are posh, people who are poor, people who are you know, humdrum, whatever, whatever it is that you want to distinguish between your characters, you can use the dialogue to help do that as well. So that's kind of quite good. Um, so... Um, Oh, a couple of things. I think the club is still being heavily theorised in Elite, yes. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the, the club was um, actually Frontiers Law Construction, so I've only kind of used it and tried to add a bit of flesh to it. So um, it'll be interesting to see um, um, you know, what, what, they, what they do with it, if anything, in the, in the future. So, yeah, that, that, was, that was quite good fun to write that stuff. Um, and, yeah, um, you also have different ways to talk to your friends. There's, uh, that's from Chris. Um, there's polite, dear, the friendly, ribbing and joking as well. So yes, and that that's that's very um, um, culture sensitive. So particularly in the UK, if you're if you're ribbing somebody a lot and joking around with them and insulting them, it generally tends to indicate to outsiders that you're quite friendly uh, and actually like each other a lot. Um, and um, there's a, there was a classic thing on Facebook actually just a couple of days ago. I think I saw the thing, um, a kind of foreigner's guide to English uh, banter or something like that. And it was sort of, um, um, you know, if an English person is insulting you, they like you. Uh, if an English person is enthusiastically being nice to you, it means they hate you. <laughs> and if an English person is studiously ignoring you and won't even make eye contact, it probably means they're in love with you. <laughs> and that, 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 you know, 
in, 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 in this culture, that sort of makes sense. Now, different countries will have different ways of, of interpreting those sort of things. And, um, um, you know, so you can use that um, if, if you want to play around with the complexities of culture. I mean, it's not something that uh, I don't, don't think would be very easy. It could be quite easy to misunderstand. But, you know, those sort of things are all things that you can play with. Um, and, okay, okay, that's interesting, Steve. I played around with covert over truth over lies. Um, and so, yeah, so your, you know, your characters um, are probably not omniscient in the book that you're writing. And they may be bad eggs or they may be good. And um, uh, they may be distrust, you know, uh, distrustful characters, characters that are actually out to mislead other characters. Or you might have gullible characters in your story. And so there's no need for your characters to be telling the truth at any given point at all. They may have their own agenda and they're trying to further that agenda. So um, you can make your characters lie. The dialogue can be deliberately ambiguous because of that. Um, you know, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Um, classic sort of stuff from um, Yes Minister is brilliant like that. Um, in a comedy setting, you know, you've got the classic um, uh, one that I love, I, I quote at work quite often, which is um, when uh, Sir Humphrey and, uh, is talking about um, um, unemployment in the UK and uh, the minister saying, right, you must reduce the unemployment figures. And the civil servant goes away and he comes back and uh, he said, we've still got far too many people unemployed. Yes, sir. But I ask you to reduce the unemployment figures. I have reduced the unemployment figures, but we've still got too many people who are unemployed. You didn't ask me about the people who are unemployed, sir. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. You asked me to reduce the unemployment figures. That's what I've done. But, 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 <laughs> so you get those lovely comic juxtapositions between all sorts of stuff like that as well, um, where people deliberately misunderstand things in order to, to get away with stuff. So lots of comedy, lots of lying and deception and politics and all sorts of stuff can be played through in the dialogue. So it's a really, really powerful tool to try and make you, um, you know, try and make the story exciting. So and if you combine that with all the other things that we've been talking about, it's, it's, it's a really, really important part of the, you know, the kit bag of writing to get across what your story is about. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of good. But do do read it out loud. That really really helps. Um, <laughs> Steve Shaw, yes. Uh, Blackadder using humour to get the point across or straight to the point. Yeah, talking to it. Yeah, so I mean, Blackadder and, and comedy like that is is a masterclass actually in clever writing. I know you. Know, um, if you just enjoy those shows for what they are, which is you know they are comedy. Um, sometimes you can be completely blind to the skill of the writers uh, that have, have put together the juxtaposition of the various bits and pieces, uh, and then the set pieces and the repeat gags and all those kind of things. Um, it's very, very clever stuff. Um, it's it's worth watching a, a Blackadder actually, particularly series two and three, um, for and and just step back from the comedy for a bit because you probably know it inside out anyway, and just analyse the the dialogue and the structure that they've used. It, it is really, really clever stuff. Very, very, very clever stuff. Um, Elite Dangerous Culture would be extremely interesting. A gigantic difference between the rich and the poor. Like the commanders flying private spaceships and people living in slums and slavery. Yeah, it would. You know, the difference in culture between the, the, you know, the, the, the different ends of the um, spectrum in Elite would be uh, fascinating. Um, although I must admit, David Braben did tell me that um, People flying spaceships are sort of treated a bit um, second class in the Elite Dangerous universe. They're sort of looked down upon um, as kind of itinerant people. So um, people in the space stations feel they're a little bit of a cutter above the um, the people who fly spaceships. I, well, you, you're just on a spaceship. I've got an actual residence. You know, so that's kind of the impression I was given from the law, um, which is actually a little bit rather like um, Firefly. Um, you know, the people in the ships are kind of just the you know, the hoi ploy, trying to muck out a living between the space stations and um, the people who actually settle on the planet a little bit, you know, higher quality, kind of in a social standing. So that's, that's the vibe that I was given for Elite Dangerous, uh, which is interesting. Yeah, so it's less yachts. It's more sort of um, white van men, really. <laughs> so we are sort of space truckers um, in, in, in the Elite Dangerous law, which is quite fun. Um, sticky <laughs> stick insect, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is a classic line. Um, uh, my my favourite one um, from Blackadder, I think it must be. I think it's season two. Is is the here's a bag of monies, which I'm not going to give to you. <laughs> it's just it's just brilliant. It just makes me chuckle even thinking about it. Um, 
And uh, so, so, yeah, some of that stuff is very cleverly props. It's worth, uh, particularly in comedy shows, it's worth analysing them a bit for, for techniques and stuff like that. Um, and, and goes forth is very good, very, very good. Stuck on a sticky bun. Yep. Uh, some of that stuff are very, very clever indeed. So, yeah, the dialogue, in summary, the dialogue is a really, really important tool because it can be biting, it can be witty, it can be clever, it can be dis disarming, it can lead the reader off into a different direction than where the description is going and give them a sort of, hang on a minute, what's, what are these guys, what's going on here? And uh, I'm just <laughs> the wise woman. <laughs> That's a fabulous one, um, isn't it? Two things, two things you should know about the wise woman. <laughs> Firstly, she's wise. Yes. Secondly, she's a woman. You know it then. Yeah. Oh, I love that stuff. Uh, just still funny. Still funny. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's, um, um, yeah, that actually that vibe, Blake Seven and Firefly, has got the same sort of um, uh, thing. Um, you know, people on the spaceships are slightly less social class than people who aren't on the spaceships, which is, which is interesting because, you, know, um, you know, we tend to think of people with kind of big yachts and things on Earth as kind of, you know, upper class and so on and so forth, at least lots of money anyway. Um, and uh, <laughs> Chris Feige is now just chucking <laughs> black hat quotes in the stream of just a wild stab in the dark, which incidentally is what you're going to be getting, we're just not being a bit more helpful. <laughs> That's just absolutely brilliant humour. Um, and Red Dwarf is another one. If you d if you haven't seen Red Dwarf, there's some fantastic bits of dialogue in that sort of stuff and set pieces on on humour. So so yeah, so dialogue is brilliant. Dialogue is really really exciting, and there's a lot to be played around with um, in there. Really 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 powerful tool. And the fact that people can still quote bits of Black Adder dialogue from 30 40 years ago um, just shows how 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 well that's stuck in the memory of certain things that people say. And even um, I mean, I quote it a lot as well. Um, Star Wars, the original uh, New Hope film, you know, a, um, bits and pieces like Ben Kenobi um, and, you know, Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you strike me down, I should become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Now, George Lucas wasn't great at dialogue and he got worse, actually, as he went on, um, in my opinion. But um, some of those lines are just iconic now and everyone can kind of quote them. Ah, my yoga printers. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Uh, just sticks so dialogue can be really really memorable memorable more so than some of the, some of the events in the stories <laughs> don't, don't start us on monty python he's not the best huh? he's a very naughty boy um so uh um they you know they, they are very clever and the reason they're clever is that the people you know they had some damn good writers behind the scenes there doing the dialogue and, and just having fun and um you know ben elton um brilliant absolutely brilliant writer if you've read any of his books actually uh, there's a there's a brilliant book called Incompetent that uh, he wrote, and uh, <laughs> he's not a very naughty. He's a very naughty boy. He certainly is. <laughs> um, but Ben Elton's written some really really good stuff. Um, out actually in novels and stuff. Um, definitely worth checking some of those things out. They're very very good. So comedy, suspense, drama, threat, all those emotions, dialogue can bring out. Um, and you can kind of get a, a sense of characterization from all those kind of things, and that can be that can be quite good fun. <laughs> right, I am. I must admit, I'm, I'm already kind of. We've been doing this an hour and twenty minutes already. Um, I am out of time once more. So, anyway, just to summarise that then. So uh, let's just go back on that. So read it out loud. That's really important. Otherwise, it's going to sound. It will sound clunky when you read it back. Otherwise, so it, it's quite hard. You kind of feel very, very self-conscious to start with. Definitely a worthwhile tool to try and do that. Read it out loud and see if it works when you when you actually speak it. Um, use it to pull out all the emotions. Don't be afraid to break the rules of grammar in dialogue. The only other thing I'd say about that is keep it in quotes. Uh, generally in the UK, um, the style seems to be use single quotes. I don't know why. Uh, in America, they tend to use double quotes. Um, that just seems to be a British-American thing. I don't know whether other countries do. Um, in terms of publishing books. Um, and try and use a new line for every new piece of dialogue. So it breaks up the flow of the page. If you look at some um, Shaywood again, if I can find a passage that is there's quite a lot of dialogue in. Mm. There we go, that'll probably do. So you can probably see here, um, every time there's a piece of dialogue, there's a new line. And in this case, there's a paragraph indent to just make it a little bit easier to read. 
Um, that's quite important just to make it easier for the reader to get through. Don't put your dialogue and then kind of join them all together in a paragraph. New line for every person who's swapping seats. It helps the reader to see what's um, what's going on and that, that fact there's a dialogue change going up makes it a bit easier to navigate. That's another one. And then just you know just have fun exploring the range of options you've got in terms of emotions and styles and speech and social setting all those kind of things. Those are the kind of things. So it's a really really important tool to to help out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a blancmange. <laughs> yeah, we haven't got time for all those kind of classic quotes. That's brilliant. Um, so um, that's it. Anyway, I must cut it short again because um, I've only got an hour, and I need to I need to crack on and get some sleep because um, time is ticking um, for me. And uh, but hopefully, anyway, hopefully you found that interesting again tonight. Thank you ever so much for uh, popping along and um, interacting with me on my stream, which is great. Um, hopefully we'll get a little bit uh, more regular. Um, topic for next week. I haven't decided yet. Um, we've done a bit of characterization. I might do a little bit more on that. Um, there's um, there's some other bits and pieces as well. I will, I will let you know. So I'll, I'll pop something up on Twitter and Facebook, depending on what it's going to be. And uh, Oh, congratulations on your invite letter for uni. Congratulations, Peter. Well done. Which, which uni are you going to? Find out in a minute when the, the chat catches up. There's always a delay on the chat, isn't there? <laughs> I suppose it's got to type it in. Um, so um, yeah, I'll come up with a topic. So might do a bit more characterization because um, that's the piece, and we've got to get on to some of the um, um, actual kind of doing bits of, of writing as well, the actual typing and the. Uh, there it's, 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 oh, congratulations! Well, anyway, I hope that goes well, fella. Um, presumably you're starting there um, fairly soon, are you? October time, I'm assuming. Is that end of September? Um, so, um, so what are you studying? That's the other question. Or reading? Cause that, that's the correct thing for a university, isn't it? Reading. I had a friend at university, uh, not at university, at school once, who said, uh, oh, "That's great. That's great. I'm a, I, I didn't know that they had a university of reading." So no, that's no, reading, fella. <laughs> uh, so, um, I, uh, up on the twelfth of September. Oh, that's not long. That's a week. Yeah. So, what, what are you, what are you, um, what are you reading at university? Peter, do let us know. Hopefully it's advanced authoring or something like that. <laughs> uh, a Bachelor of Arts in Game Arts. Oh, good for you. Bachelor of uh, Bachelor of Honours. Hmm. So presumably it's a three year a three year course. Oh that'd be um that'd be good. Well we'll look forward to seeing some of your output on that one then. And so bring some of those things back. Hopefully you can still watch the stream when you're off at university. So that'd be quite cool. <laughs> but good luck. I went to university in nineteen eighty eight, which is Terrifyingly long ago now, um, and that was studying computer science. But there we go. Um, I don't do much computer science anymore, but uh, it did give me a few bits and pieces along the way, so that's cool. <laughs> so good stuff. So yes, next week's topic, I will um, I will advise possibly characterization, possibly a little bit about the actual mechanics of writing, um, and we'll we'll go through from there. And um, Hopefully it will be a little bit more regular because I've kind of got out of holiday season now and a few other bits and pieces. And I'm hoping um, to have some uh, other news for you in a, in a few weeks' time. So um, once uh, once I've confirmed a few things, I'll, there'll be hopefully a little reveal on the stream. So can't tell you much more about that at the moment, but it will be coming up before the uh, before the end of the month. So that will be really good, uh, which is all good news, I think. So um, we'll go from there. So I shall um, bid you all farewell. Thank you very much for listening. And... Um, I will uh, see you next week. And I still haven't got a natty handoff. I'm still working on a natty handoff. So I still need to think of something. <laughs> and we'll, you know, something like the write on commander. But I can't use write on commander. So any suggestions, do let me know. That'd be really good. Anyway, folks, be good. Um, stay safe and all that kind of good stuff. And I look forward to seeing you next week. All the best. Take care now. <laughs>